Um, hello, friends. Uh, my name is John Cho. I am a member of Flushing Meeting, which is located in Queens, New York, uh, part of New York Elite Meeting. And uh, I wear several hats. Um, I'm also the current president of the Flushing Interfaith Council, which is a coalition of different uh, churches, synagogues, mosques, um, various uh, houses of worship in our community uh, that provides a lot of uh, education and solidarity work. And then <clears throat> lastly, I'm also the executive director of the Greater Flushing Chamber of Commerce, which is a nonprofit organization that helps um, our community with, uh, again, uh, education, advocacy, and networking programs. And uh, just a little bit about my background before I uh, get into my slideshow and Q&A. Um, I was born in Korea, and my family migrated to Australia. I lived there for about a decade before I um, came to New York with my family and went to high school and college here. Um, I received a, a degree in history at Binghamton University and a, a master's in public policy. Um, my background is in uh, government and politics and uh, public service. And uh, when I came back from school, I uh, worked with um, a number of community organizations, um, including the Committee Against Anti-Asian Violence, uh, as well as a new group that I helped to form called Noruto for Korean Community um, Development. And um, we worked on many different issues around uh, immigrant rights and uh, also making sure that uh, we promoted peace in, in the Korean Peninsula. So that was a lot of my work um, up to the 1990s. Um, and uh, in 1996, our local councilwoman, Julia Harrison, um, <clears throat> told the New York Times that the Asian immigrants moving into her district were essentially robbers and thieves and that we came uh, to conquer and invade the neighborhood. And as you can imagine, uh, many people were very upset about those remarks uh, by an elected official um, basically scapegoating her own constituents for many of the problems that were taking place in Flushing, Queens at that time, including uh, uh, overdevelopments, um, poor sanitation, and other issues regarding traffic congestion, uh, quality of life issues, et cetera. Uh, I helped to organize uh, demonstrations, rallies, and protests um, and demanded her resignation, but she did not resign. Uh, in fact, she won re-election at the next election with the support of the local Democratic Party. Um, I uh, reconnected with people from college and ended up working with uh, one of my classmates, John Liu, who uh, uh, entered uh, city government as the first elected official in New York. Um, this was in 2001, um, representing Flushing Queens, uh, taking over the position uh, that Julia Harrison vacated with term limits. And uh, I became his legislative director. We enacted uh, a series of reforms, including the first uh, language access bill, uh, which basically um, mandates that all city agencies, uh, especially those uh, focused on health and human services, provide programs in different languages. Uh, up until that point, um, if you were sick or if you had serious health uh, problems uh, 
and you didn't speak English, uh, you basically um, were not served and um, you didn't have ac full access to all the resources that New York residents had at that time. And so we were able to push through these uh, landmark bills and really, uh, in my view, made a, a big difference for uh, immigrants, for um, new uh, Americans who were moving into uh, Queens and other uh, places in New York City. Um, after that experience, I uh, worked uh, with John Liu when he was elected to uh, the city comptroller office, uh, which is the top um, uh, fiscal officer of the city, uh, <laughs> right below the mayor, and um, I worked on several projects that uh, um, included uh, looking at um, gender uh, pay disparities in uh, city uh, municipal workforce, um, looking at uh, community development policies around um, uh, housing and uh, um, building development in different neighborhoods and community benefits for those projects. Um, but I really wanted to go back to Flushing. And so <clears throat> uh, I ended up um, returning to Flushing, Queens, uh, establishing the Greater Flushing Chamber of Commerce and uh, really uh, advocated on behalf of immigrant entrepreneurs and small business owners, uh, many of whom uh, had no information on how to access city services. Um, uh, many of them were, uh, even though <clears throat> uh, many of them had help to revive Flushing. Um, you know, I don't know if any of you have visited Flushing, but in the um, 70s and 80s, uh, we had a huge uh, flight of white people from New York City into the suburbs. And uh, Flushing was one of those neighborhoods that um, fell into disrepair. We had vacant storefronts, um, rising crime, um, a lot of uh, problems with uh, many middle-class families abandoning our neighborhood. And so what many people feel saved Flushing was the uh, influx of immigrants um, who reestablished businesses and uh, start to have families, uh, start to um, send their children to local schools, um, uh, and really uh, changing the fabric of New York City, not just in Flushing, but throughout um, New York City uh, in the 2000s. Um, you know, uh, New York City, despite uh, all of the problems that we've faced, um, isn't Detroit. You know, Detroit is a city that um, lost a million residents um, and their government went, was bankrupt at a certain point. Um, New York City actually uh, gained a million uh, residents and was able to continue to provide services um, uh, for uh, our residents. Um, uh, I would say because of uh, the labor and taxes that were generated through uh, uh, immigrants coming into New York City. Um, and so I felt as someone who is a community organizer that um, the city had to really um, support neighborhoods like Flushing, um, that we were not on the margins of New York City um, uh, economic life, but we were actually central to um, making cities like New York more resilient and uh, more um, sustainable. Um, because one of the problems with New York City over the over the many decades is that we have become very reliant on Wall Street, uh, the financial sector to prop up our economy. Uh, and so whenever we have a national recession, uh, New York City's uh, tax revenue uh, goes into a nose 
die of and uh, we have to cut um, hundreds of thousands of uh, 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 employees um, we have to cut uh, school programs and social services and health programs um, and uh, I again I argue that um, it's because of the influx of immigrants that uh, New York City has been able to overcome these challenges and continue to prosper as a city. And, uh, but unfortunately the government has not really recognized that. And so a lot of the programs um, and tax subsidies still go to large corporations. Um, I don't know if you remember uh, a couple of years ago um, New York City and New York State were going to provide more than $3 billion of tax subsidy uh, programs to Amazon to locate their headquarters in Queens. And I was one of the people who uh, was uh, opposed to that, um, not only because uh, Amazon never needed that money to relocate to New York City, but um, our government has never... Uh, provided uh, $3 billion of anything like that to um, small businesses or immigrant entrepreneurs or any of the programs and services that we need in neighborhoods like Flushing. Um, when Mayor Bloom Bloomberg was in uh, City Hall, he actually uh, used $2 billion of city uh, capital funds to extend the 7 train, which is uh, one of the main subway lines to Flushing, um, but not on the Flushing side. He extended it in Manhattan into Hudson Yards, which was uh, basically an empty uh, development zone that was uh, being provided to super wealthy developers to build luxury condos and commercial spaces. And so, again, it's just another example of uh, city governments uh, uh, really not acknowledging the role of immigrants and um, uh, basically uh, 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 providing an unequal and inequitable uh, 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 distribution of resources. Um, and so, you know, again, Mayor Bloomberg or any of his successes um, have never contributed $2 billion of city capital funds to support transportation infrastructure on the other side of the 7 train in Flushing, Queens, where there's actually a growing, uh, thriving community that actually has needs. Um, so that's uh, been the focus of my work over the past couple of years. Um, and I wanted to show you some photographs of uh, the uh, what uh, how the pandemic has impacted flushing and what we have been doing during the pandemic. And so uh, it's not a long uh, slideshow, but I just wanted to give you some context for what's going on in Flushing, Queens. So let me see if I can share. Hold on. All right, so can everyone see those slides? I'm gonna assume that you can. All right, so um, let's see. Uh, so um, <clears throat> very early on during the pandemic, um, again, um, I don't know if anyone remembers, but um, there was a huge uh, wave of fear especially in the media. And so you had um, the New York Post, uh, the New York Times, many of the mainstream media outlets saying that this was an Asian disease that, um, you know, uh, to watch out um, uh, for uh, Chinese people because they had the disease and they were spreading it, even though that was not true. In fact, the first reported cases of COVID actually came through Europe. Um, but it had a devastating impact on our small businesses in Flushing because many of our businesses and our community uh, is predominantly immigrant and uh, Chinese. Um, 
And so we actually tried to support local businesses by um, uh, uh, having um, uh, meetups and um, meals uh, at some of the local restaurants, for example. This is one at a local food court on Main Street and um, Roosevelt in downtown Flushing. Um, in uh, March, I worked with an organization called La Jornada, which uh, set up a food pantry and started to distribute food to people who, who were growing hungry because there was actually a lockdown in New York City and uh, you couldn't get food uh, from supermarkets or grocery stores or restaurants because they were all closed. Um, and so we started off feeding, I think, about 4,000 families, uh, which doubled to 8,000 families and eventually to 10,000 families every week. Um, you know, uh, Thursday, uh, Friday, Saturday, and then eventually every day of the week, um, except Sunday. Um, I also uh, worked with other organizations to deliver food to senior citizens and uh, immunocompromised individuals who couldn't even leave their homes to go to food pantries. Um, uh, this is something that the city did not provide. Um, in terms of uh, uh, immediate assistance uh, right after the lockdown was established. The city did eventually uh, provide uh, deliveries, uh, but it took several months for that to happen. Uh, this is uh, just a photograph of the line at the food pantry. Um, you can see the line outside of this photograph, but it goes on for several blocks. Um, it goes on for like five city blocks uh, in, in downtown Flushing. So um, uh, here you see people uh, in the middle of uh, winter um, basically waiting for hours in uh, very cold weather to get this food. Uh, so this is the line on Main Street. Uh, I worked with um, many of the restaurant owners um, to promote, uh, again, the, uh, the fact that flushing uh, needs um, support, um, uh, that uh, the businesses need customers to su survive. Um, uh, flushing Queens, uh, even though we have one of the highest concentrations of small businesses in New York, uh, didn't receive a lot of PPP loans and other uh, federal assistance during this period, um, uh, which it's I think it's uh, a testimony to the, uh, the fact that the federal government didn't really know how to um, support uh, uh, diverse communities in cities like New York, um, that uh, many of their uh, initial loans and grants were to actually very large corporations who are abusing the system. Um, at this time, uh, we also continue to have rallies in support of Black Lives Matter. Um, I don't remember the exact uh, chrono chronology, but um, you know, during this time, George Floyd was murdered and um, we felt that as an immigrant uh, Asian American community, we needed to stand up with our African American brothers and sisters and say that um, the way they were being treated was simply unjust and unacceptable. Um, we did a lot of promotional campaigns and marketing to support the small business. Uh, rebuild, uh, but I think um, the amount of resources that we had uh, was very limited and uh, many businesses actually ended up closing. Um, I know one restaurant owner, uh, her landlord forced her to pay rent throughout this period, even though 
she was in inside an interior mall which was closed to the public and so uh even though no one could actually access her restaurant she was still forced to pay rent and eventually had to close her business um it's another business that we helped support um we did a lot of surveys um including uh, a campaign to uh, improve bus service uh, this was, again, difficult to do during the middle of the pandemic, but um, we were actually successful in get, getting city government to establish a busway. Um, uh, I don't know if you have been to New York City, but uh, public transit is a critical part of uh, our economy. Um, uh, the frontline workers working at restaurants at, and supermarkets in local schools and hospitals, the only way they could get to work, uh, many of them uh, working class people, was to use public transit. And yet um, the city didn't provide uh, enough infrastructure and, and uh, uh, service to support those workers. And so we actually ended up uh, establishing a busway, which um, really made the buses much more reliable in downtown Flushing and uh, the streets safer. Uh, I believe there was almost a 50% decline uh, after the, the busway was established of uh, traffic fatalities and, and uh, crashes uh, on Main Street. Um, th this is another uh, Black Lives Matter rally. Um, we're actually counter protesting another group <laughs> that you can't really see that was supporting uh, police officers and their chant was Blue Lives Matter. And uh, I think many of you can see the, the problem with trying to foreground the lives of police officers when um, uh, uh, many of them uh, uh, were not uh, taking into consideration, consideration the lives of um, the people there was that was sworn to protect. Um, we also uh, continue to, to support green markets. Um, this is one market that we um, opened with Grow NYC. Uh, it's, it was one of the few open air markets. And so uh, during the lockdown, it was critical for, uh, for people who needed to get um, uh, fresh fruits and, and vegetables from local farmers. Um, we uh, continue to give out food. This is food that was prepared uh, by local restaurants um, and subsidized by a number of different charities that we worked with. Uh, we also, at the green market, um, started art exhibits and uh, cultural programs because uh, not only were supermarkets and, and restaurants closed, but um, museums and cultural institutions were closed at the same time. And so we wanted to make sure that um, people still had connections to local artists and cultural activities during the lockdown. Uh, this is another campaign um, that I participated in. Uh, during the pandemic, the city tried to push through a development project um, called the Special Flushing Waterfront District, uh, which would have um, established more than a thousand units of luxury uh, condominiums, uh, hotels, and um, uh, malls. Um, we felt that actually what the community needed was affordable housing. Um, uh, they, the developers uh, ended up providing or promising to build, um, I believe it was uh, 60 units of affordable housing, which is clearly not enough to serve our community. Um, in two previous rounds of affordable housing development, um, uh, one was called Macedonia Plaza, which had 141 units of affordable housing uh, almost 40,000 applications were received for that lottery to get 141 units of housing uh, in that 
uh, project. The second project, a couple of years later, um, I believe had about 200 units and uh, they received almost 80,000 applications for those uh, 200 plus units uh, at one flushing. So uh, the demand for affordable housing is clear and uh, the city um, really did a disservice to our community by uh, trying to push through this luxury development project in the middle of a pandemic. People couldn't even go to City Hall to testify. Um, people uh, were not aware of what the city was doing um, uh, uh, in, in this matter. Um, I can go on, on about this, but um, unfortunately, um, uh, despite our efforts, this uh, project was approved. Uh, this is another photograph of uh, another protest that we organized. Um, this is one of the housing organizers I work with, uh, talking about how um, developers and uh, uh, large financial corporations are buying apartment buildings in downtown Flushing and uh, basically uh, harassing and, and evicting uh, the renters there so they could jack up the, the rents. Um, this is a practice that uh, is very uh, prevalent in Flushing, but happens throughout the city. Um, and it was happening during the pandemic, uh, even though at, at one point there was a moratorium on evictions, um, uh, the average rent in, in New York City is now about $3,500. Uh, and for a working class family, uh, there's no way they can afford that. Uh, we continue to do cultural programming, um, uh, including, uh, uh, you know, different celebrations of Korean and Chinese um, harvest festivals. This is one for the Korean community. Um, this is uh, a uh, image of one of the luxury developments in Flushing. Um, it's uh, these renderings by developers, uh, they look very beautiful uh, and very clean, but what they uh, hide is the fact that most of these developments um, are uh, unaffordable. Um, these apartment units go for a million dollars or more, and uh, half, uh, at least half of these units are not uh, even occupied, they're vacant. Uh, many of them are used for investment purposes. Um, many of the uh, owners uh, are actually living uh, overseas. So uh, even though the city is supporting this type of development, it's not actually uh, supporting local residents in New York City. Um, <clears throat> this is a gentleman uh, who uh, was found in a cardboard box sleeping um, and who had passed away overnight. Um, <clears throat> he was an elderly Asian American uh, immigrant and uh, like many immigrant workers had lost uh, their jobs and uh, any ability to survive. Um, you can tell he's Asian because he uh, took off his shoes and, and placed them outside the box. Um, but uh, we don't know how many people died during the pandemic uh, because they lost housing or income. But this is something that um, I think is just morally wrong for the richest city in the richest uh, country in the world um, to allow senior citizens to basically die alone on a public street like this in New York City. Uh, this is a photograph of the food pantry um, where we would cook food for uh, volunteers. Um, these are former restaurant workers living under a bridge. Um, I had participated in an outreach uh, 
to the workers during Christmas. We provided food and backpacks with clothing and um, uh, sleeping bags. Um, a, a lot of attention has been uh, put to business owners and restaurant owners, but very little attention has been placed on the workers, uh, especially immigrant workers. These are the people who, if you go to a restaurant, are working in the kitchen, um, cleaning uh, uh, your tables and making the food that you eat. And yet we cannot take care of them when uh, things fall apart. Uh, it's, it's really an indictment on uh, this country that we can't take care of workers. Um, and that's it. So um, I just wanted to give you a sense of uh, what we did during the pandemic. Um, and um, maybe I could take some questions and um, talk about what we're doing now. But uh, I wanted to just give you a sense of uh, what happened in neighbors like Flushing, Queens uh, these past three years. How, how uh, similar is Flushing to other uh, neighborhoods in uh, especially Queens and and, uh, and Brooklyn and the Bronx? Uh, is, there, is, that, is that a similar story for many of, of those uh, areas? Yeah, so um, one thing about Flushing is that in many ways it's um, kind of uh, the canary in the coal mine, uh, flushing has really developed much more, uh, uh, much faster and has been much more diverse in its population demographics um, than other communities. Um, and I can go into the whole history. It's, it's a long conversation, but um, I would say that uh, other neighborhoods are catching up to the diversity of Flushing. Um, uh, New York City, as I mentioned before, uh, couldn't have survived without immigrants moving in. And so uh, uh, many neighborhoods throughout the city um, are starting to, or have faced many of the, the, uh, the, the challenges that I've mentioned. Um, you know, our, um, uh, commercial districts in downtown Flushing has rents that are higher than in midtown Manhattan. And for a lot of people, they just don't understand how that's possible because uh, and all of the resources, like I said before, they go to these major corporations that have headquarters in Manhattan. Uh, we're just a rinky-dink little neighborhood in Queens at the end of the seven train um, uh, but we actually generate, uh, the small businesses generate, you know, more than $1.5 billion of sales every year. Um, we have, uh, 40 plus bank branches. We're one of the largest financial centers in the entire country. Um, we have an enormous, um, entrepreneurial activity, uh, uh, not just locally, but um, tied to international trade. Um, and so, again, while what's going on in Flushing is uh, certainly unique in some ways, um, I don't think, uh, I think it's it's something that other neighborhoods are starting to face, um, this type of development where you have neighbor neighborhoods that are not necessarily tied to Manhattan, but are tied to you know, trade with Taiwan or South Korea or um, uh, Vietnam, you know, um, and where, you know, uh, people uh, are not necessarily uh, speaking 
you know, Yiddish or come from Ireland or, you know, have a German background, but are coming from Latin America and Asia primarily. Yeah, I, I always love going to Flushing. Um, it's uh, it, it's got its own airport, LaGuardia, and of course the World Fair was uh, w was in Flushing. Um, so I mean, if you if you look on a map and you see where it is, um, it's it, well, it, it's also the other Chinatown too. I mean, there's Chinatown in. Uh, Manhattan, but Flushing's also known as the second Chinatown. So it's a very, very interesting place. And that's where George Fox went to preach. And it, just around the corner from Flushing Meeting is a, a big tree that, uh, well, the tree's gone, but there's the, there's a, a, a There's a, a plaque and a tree trunk showing where uh, George Fox preached that turned Flushing into a, um, a hotbed of Quakerism. I mean, for, from what I, I see, Arch Street meeting in uh, Philadelphia is certainly where Quakers started in Philadelphia, but Flushing is certainly where, certainly Flushing came before, before that. And, um, Quakers started in Flushing before in, before Philadelphia. You 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 saw one of um, John's T-shirts. It had Flushing established 1645. That's very cool. Yeah. Susanna, I got cut off uh, for a couple of minutes. Um, did you have a question? No, I was just talking about um, Flushing. Okay. The, the geography of it and the world, right. the, the World's Fair, Lagardia. Just, just to get an idea of what's what's around there. Yeah. Tom, did you have a question? Yes, I do. Does Flushing have its own uh, unit of government, or does it depend on the Queen's government? So, um, Flushing, uh, as uh, Susanna mentioned, uh, was established in 1645 by the Dutch. Um, <laughs> And it had its own government until um, 1900 uh, when the city was consolidated and Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan, and the Bronx uh, and Staten Island became one city. I see. Oh. Uh, we have uh, a town hall, Flushing Town Hall, which was our seat of government. Uh, it's no longer a government office. It's a cultural uh uh, institution. Um, they have amazing performances. I would definitely recommend you going there, but we don't have our own government. Does does Queens have any form of local government any since the consolidation? So uh, we have uh, this institution called the Borough Presidents, which is a relic of the county executive um uh position that uh used to exist before the consolidation um actually right up to the 1980s the uh, the borough presence had an enormous power uh because we our city government was controlled by the board of estimate uh where each of the borough presidents had a vote um unfortunately for them the Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional because it violated the one person, one vote principle. And so that uh, form of city government was disbanded and uh, borough presidents no longer wield any significant power. Uh, they are mostly advisors uh, on land use issues, for example. Uh, during the um, 1960s, uh, the city tried to establish community um, boards. These are local neighborhood uh, focused um, advisory councils. But again, uh, they're mostly advisory and have no formal power uh, 
in in city government. Um, our city government at, uh, currently is a strong mayor system where the mayor is basically uh, uh, in control of city government uh, in partnership with a uh, 51 member city council. So you, you're only, uh, Flushing's only uh, redress is to city council and the mayor. That's correct. Okay. And, you know, <clears throat> a lot of people don't realize the uh, scale of city government, but um, New York City spends every year about $100 billion um, in programs and services, which makes New York City the fourth largest jurisdiction outside of the US government, the state of California, the state of New York, and then it's the city of New York. It's, it's just huge in terms of its economic uh, and political power. Yes, Barbara. Uh, thank you very much, John. It was uh, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, how how do you and your volunteers um, how do you raise money for things like a food pantry and 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 the other kinds of things that that you try and do for for the indigent? Sure. Um, so uh, first of all, the food pantry. Um, we served about 10,000 people every week. And so we had people who were not necessarily poor, but who just didn't have access to food. Um, many of them were senior citizens with limited incomes. Um, many of them were uh, working families who lost their uh, jobs. Um, some of them were people who lost their housing. So, um, it was a very broad sector uh, of our community that needed food. These were not the traditional uh, indigent population that you may uh, be visualizing. Um, these were people who uh, were suffering in, uh, during a global pandemic. And um, uh, unfortunately, uh, I have to say that my own congregation flushing meeting was not very forthcoming in terms of contributing funds to help the local food pantries. Um, through the Interfaith Council, we were able to get contributions from other congregations, uh, including the Hindu temple here, um, the oldest Hindu temple in uh, North America. Uh, as well as the Mormon Church um, and many other religious organizations. But uh, unfortunately, my own congregation uh, did not contribute that much to the effort. Um, we relied also on uh, local businesses to contribute. Um, much of the uh, hot food that was distributed was actually cooked by local restaurants. Um, uh, we would often raise money to support those restaurants, uh, but um, that was actually difficult to, to do was uh, provide hot food. Um, so the bulk of the food that we got was uh, um, stuff that you would find in the grocery, canned foods, um, dry foods, uh, vegetables. Um, we had one vegetable wholesaler who uh, donated a lot of the surplus uh, food that he had every week. Uh, this was like uh, thousands of tons of food. Um, so many businesses were very generous in contributing and supporting our efforts. Um, uh, unfortunately, you know, government uh, didn't step up until much later on. And, um, you know, again, this, this is on the scale of a natural disaster. And so 
you can't depend on uh, houses of worship or local businesses to sustain this type of effort. But we really needed the local state and federal government to step in. And eventually they did, uh, although um, last year they, they actually closed the food pantry. And so there's actually a concern uh, in downtown Flushing about whether people continue to have access to food, especially with uh, increasing inflation and cost of living. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the rents in Flushing are extremely high. And so uh, that is really uh, a public need that needs to be addressed uh, by governments uh, long term. Thank you. Thank you, John. I actually just had a, a comment. You, you'd you mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, COVID was not, uh, you know, even though it may have originated, it was first Europeans who kind of brought it. Um, we did the same thing with, you know, the quote unquote Spanish influenza. We, we know definitively now that it, that it actually originated in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And we call it, you know, some other, you know, people's problem, right? And then, uh, that that typically is how we uh, we handle uh, pandemics. It seems like in in the U.S. Yeah, and it's not just pandemics, but uh, it seems like our society is susceptible to um, these uh, waves of anxiety and fear campaigns. Right now, you, you have this uh, rather xenophobic campaign against TikTok, uh, a major social media platform, uh, purely because uh, it has, uh, it's, it, it was developed in China and has uh, Chinese government, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 investments in that company. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you look at the history of immigration to the United States, it is not one that we should be proud of. Um, the United States was one of the only countries that uh, created uh, immigration laws entirely on race. Uh, for example, the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, uh, which was actually a series of acts that um, existed for decades uh, and only excluded Chinese people. Um, uh, we had other laws excluding uh, people from Japan and other countries as well. Um, we had uh, laws that uh, denied uh, immigrants um, uh, the ability to naturalize as citizens uh, purely because of their race. Um, we had laws in California and other states that um, denied people the ability to own land um, and to be able to testify in juries, uh, including Asian Americans. Um, so the history of uh, immigration to the United States is not something that we can be very proud of, actually, even though uh, immigrants have contributed so much to the development of uh, this nation uh, and continue to do so. Yeah. The late Ronald Takaki, his, his uh, seminal book uh, um, was it a, a different mirror? Uh, it talks about all of the all the different others that came to the U.S. and 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 he goes on to describe all their amazing contributions to to you know to our 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 society. Uh, and there's still that capital O other right there. And uh, it seems like we always have a few others. You know, right now it's. It's, uh, you know, um, it's something different than it has been five years ago, but it, there's always the other. And it, it's obviously not, you know, white men who, who are the other. Yeah. And, you know, uh, even though um, I'm critical of people like Donald Trump for uh, leading a lot of these xenophobic efforts, um, the racism and xenophobia against immigrants uh is a long history that uh, preceded Donald Trump and um, 
the right wing movements that, that basically control our political system today. Um, uh, if you look at, uh, uh, for example, uh, in in Flushing, I mentioned that I initially got involved in politics because our local councilwoman was uh, basically rehashing a lot of these uh, yellow peril stereotypes to scapegoat her own constituents. Um, she was defended by the Democratic Party uh, that controls local politics here in, in Queens. And they continue to support some people like Julie Harrison. Um, it took more than 300 years for an Asian American to be elected. Um, and that was because so many Asian Americans were angry at what Julie Harrison had said and uh, uh, blamed us for. So uh, we have uh, still a long ways to go. Um, there's actually a campaign right now that I, I'm involved with uh, where Stephen Cohen, the owner of the New York Mets, uh, I don't know if you guys follow baseball, but he owns the New York Mets. He's uh, a multi-billionaire, the 94th wealthiest person in the entire world. Uh, he is proposing a casino right next to City Field, which is right next to Flushing. And he's presenting this proposal as a win-win for everyone because it's right next to Flushing, which is a ready market for gambling and gambling addiction. And he is relying on the same stereotypes that I had discussed earlier uh, against Asian Americans and Chinese people specifically um, as, uh, you know, carriers of vice, of uh, gambling, uh, prostitution, um, and saying, well, look, we already have a, a population that uh, likes to gamble. Um, they're going to benefit if we build a casino right next to, to Flushing. And I think it's a really despicable and offensive mm -hmm. uh, way of presenting this proposal. Uh, for a casino in New York City. Uh, but he's, he's getting away with it because no one really understands the history uh, that's, that he's relying on. Uh, governor Kathy Hochul, who is the governor of New York, actually has a campaign to end uh, enth uh, menthol cigarettes because many of you know uh, cigarette companies specifically target African Americans and Latinos to sell menthol cigarettes. And so uh, from a public policy perspective, you have the governor in New York wanting to ban menthol cigarettes. But when uh, developers want to build a casino next to uh, Flushing, an immigrant, uh, predominantly Asian American Chinese neighborhood, no one blinks the eye. No one says anything because no one thinks that it's a problem to, to present a major development uh, a project um, uh, uh, on top of a, a stereotype uh, of, of Chinese people. So, so this is something that's ongoing. As a Asian American, I, maybe I'm overly sensitive to these uh, things, but I see it all the time and it's hard to unsee. Um, and I, I don't blame any particular party. This is part of the fabric of the United States. It's as deeply ingrained as slavery and racism and white supremacy. I um, I, I listened to part of the, um, the congressional hearing um, last week of that young man. He's from Singapore. Right. He's not, I mean, I, I, I couldn't believe that they were all going on about the Chinese government when he's from Singapore. I mean, if you know anything about Chinese from Singapore, they are not fans of the Republic of China. I mean, not at all. Not even close. And, and, mm -hmm. and also, um, he, and he was educated in Britain and at Harvard. 
I mean, when yeah. did he get a chance to go and get indoctrinated in China? I mean, the whole thing makes no sense at all. And I thought that was incredible. He was so bullied. And I, I, he handled it with such grace. My gosh. It was just yeah. awful to watch. Uh, I was um, watching a TikTok video about the congressional hearings and the takeaway from that was the CEO of TikTok is basically um, a, Re a Republican Party wet dream because he's well educated, he's a capitalist, he con he controls a multi million dollar company. Right, exactly. um, you'd want to curry his <laughs> favor, <want> <laughs> right. but because he happens to look Chinese, because he looks Asian, yeah, uh, it's totally appropriate to sling all sorts of um you know uh uh racist uh you know a uh, dog whistle uh accusations about uh him being a puppet for the chinese communist party it was it was just so incredibly absurd you know it was just so some people said it was uh akin to the mccarthy hearings yeah 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 which by the way I don't know if anyone knows this, but the McCarthy hearing started as an attack on uh, peace activists who were opposing the Korean War. Yes. Wow. Yeah, it was used to shut down uh, the peace movement against the Korean War. And it was effective because no one remembers the peace movement against the Korean War. Right. Boy, yeah. So I, grew I, you, up I, thinking, I grew up thinking that the House American on Activities Committee, you know, as a, as a uh, ignorant child, that was a major element of Congress, and it had been for since the founding. You know, <laughs> so uh, yeah. you know that that was uh, at that time. You know, it, it was like the only thing you heard about Congress was uh, UAC. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I don't. Does uh, everyone? I'm, I'm assuming has seen the Manchurian Candidate, the original Manchurian Candidate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's a fascinating film because, uh, at one level, it's a liberal critique of this um, communist hysteria that was uh, prevalent in Congress at that time. But at a level, another level, <laughs> it's a deeply racist uh, caricature of Asian people. Um, this idea that um, the Chinese Communist Party uh, was brainwashing people uh, to assassinate um, American leaders. Um, who, who comes up with that kind of stuff? <laughs> Uh, it only makes sense in the context of the yellow peril and our long history of racism against Asian Americans. Yeah. You know, Lois and um, her husband, they were giving out yellow bands um, during the pandemic because there was so much, there, there was all this, they were having all kinds of, because Chinatown's right next to Arch Street, and um, the Chinese population was uh, suffering very badly. So the idea was, oh, no, it wasn't. It was a whistle. So if you were to see anything, um, any attack on anyone Asian, you were supposed to whistle. I don't know. Did you, did it work? I mean, did did you see any, Lois? I didn't see any in, in use, as in people blowing their whistles, but I did see people wearing them. And two boxes worth were picked up by vis visitors to Arch Street. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, you know, it's 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 a, a tiny little gesture, but, you know, every, the fact that we were aware of it, I mean, it was just awful. Yeah. During that time. Yeah, I you know um, even now, um, Donald Trump uh, still uses the phrase "China virus," and um, right, 
it's really upsetting because many people have pointed out to him that that type of language only reinforces anti-Asian uh, stereotypes and uh, facilitates violence against Asians in our communities, and yet he continues to use it. Um, we don't have a system of accountability in this country uh, against uh, people with power and money. Yeah. It's because we rely on 250 year old documents written by really, really rich white men <laughs> who own slaves. And we, and we hold to these principles, right? Like freedom of speech, like, right. You know, like, like equity is no more, you know, like, why is that not, you know, our, our, you know, in our constitution, right. You know, it, it it's, it, it is the way it's designed to be. Uh, and, um, if you're the other, you're the other. I, I'm Asian American. I, I'm, uh, you know, I, I have every benefit of white privilege. Uh, as when I was younger, I, I looked much more Asian than I than I do now. My father was half Japanese, half German, and you know he was born right after the war. Um, so my grandmother immigrated here uh, when she met my grandfather. Uh, he was in the Air Force, and the amount of racism he got from both ends, like you know, you know, go home, crowd, you know, go home, Jap. Um, it was just an odd experience. But then watching my father become racist himself as he got older was a wow. very, very weird experience for me because how, how can you experience that? Right. And, and for me, it, it, it just told me and reinforced me, reinforced me that the people you associate with, right. And, and your, your, your networks are, are going to be where you derive your, your ethics from. And, and Trump knows exactly what he's saying when he says those words, he knows it's, it's goading people that he wants to goad and he knows it's bringing people together that he wants to bring to his cause. And um, you're right. It's, it, there's no, there's nothing in the way to stop this from happening. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that points to the uh, systemic nature of white supremacy and racism in this country, that it's not about, individuals per se, but it's about uh, systems of control. You know, we have a very large Asian American population, as I mentioned in Flushing. Um, many of them are Trump supporters. And uh, on really? one level, it doesn't make any sense because uh, over the years, Trump has been very clear about his uh, dismissal and uh, uh, underlying hatred of Asians um, and, the, and his, uh, you know, disrespect for the Chinese government and uh, the Chinese people. Um, and yet we have a growing number of Chinese immigrants in Flushing who support um, Donald Trump and uh, his policies because, you know, One, it's one, it's, it's almost like a, uh, a hazing uh, ritual in a fraternity where, you know, you go through this terrible trauma in order to have power to traumatize other people. Um, and in the hierarchy of racism in this country, I think some Chinese people feel like, well, at least they're not African American or Latino, um, uh, which you know uh, is very clear. Like the people who support Trump um, uh, see African Americans, Latinos as even more subhuman and uh, less deserving of uh, political rights than Asian Americans, and so uh, some immigrants are latching on to the system of racism and racial hierarchy uh, that was established for people. Um, and I, you know, it, it, it's not, you know, Chinese America is not the first group uh, to do that. You know, when the Irish, uh, when Italians, when Jewish people first moved to the United States, they were not considered white. They were treated as subhuman people who uh, didn't deserve any rights or, or respect in this country. Um, I think through the assimilation process, many of them uh, took on the ideology of white supremacy and um, basically uh, 
in return for their acceptance of that system, they became white. They uh, took on the privileges of whiteness. Uh, and that's why you see people like Julia Harrison, uh, an elected official uh, with um, uh, immigrant roots, you know, uh, saying the things she said about other immigrants, right? Her ancestors lived in the Lower East Side uh, in Jewish and Italian and, and Irish neighborhoods, right? Um, they face extreme levels of dis discrimination and in inequities. And yet, now that they are elected officials and police officers and fire fighters um, and teachers, they have power and privilege that they can uh, traumatize other immigrants and other people of color. Um, and so, the cycle repeats itself. It, it's, you know, it's, unless we find a way to intervene and stop uh, institutional racism, it, it, it's a self-sustaining system. It's all about communication. This is what Benjamin Franklin um, discovered. And he set up his own print, uh, his own um, print shop um, in order to combat it. I, I had in-laws in Hazleton, and they were all um, coal miners, Polish co Polish coal miners. And uh, this was in the 1980s. And they were absolutely all for Reagan, all for this right-wing stuff. I mean, they didn't have Fox News then, but they had other things. And um, these, these people who were absolutely genetically Democrat, they were all Republican. They were all voting for this right stuff. And, and then also, too, um, the Catholic, the Ibu Catholic Church in, um, uh, in West Philadelphia that I, I used to go to, they were all pro-Trump. They were all Nigerian, Black, mm -hmm. you know, but they were Catholic. And they just, uh, they, they were absolutely all pro. And, and that was in Pennsylvania. So that they're the people that handed over um, the presidency to Trump. Wow. Yeah. I, think, I think Hillary did that on her own by not even trying <laughs> to look at the Midwest at all. But yeah, I, I, that, I do hear you. That, 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 that might be. But, but the, the fact that people vote against their own interests, this is what John's saying. And it yeah. makes no sense at all. But it's, you know, but it's widespread. From a, from a psychological stance, it kind of does make sense. And I don't, so I, I've had a lot of black and brown friends who voted for Trump, but who supported Bernie until Hillary won. And for them, it was, they just didn't want status quo anymore. And so they wanted something different. They didn't want the same talking heads. And I can, I can understand that to some degree, but for me, it's no coincidence that uh, we're the only advanced nation that only mandates two political parties. Every other advanced nation has at least three. So we have this false sense of dichotomy and, and polarization where, you know, people accuse someone like Joe Biden of being a communist, right, when he's right of center. And <laughs> and we, 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 we have this idea that liberals are like leftists, right, and that Republicans, they're, they're just so, they're all centrists. And that's what happens when you have just two parties, like, we're never going to have a third major party because why would these two parties want to split that 50 50 shot right um and for me it's not a coincidence that we also have a, any advanced nation the deepest level of poverty and, you know, and it's because we wait a minute, pat wants to uh, uh the words that kept going through my mind with this and thank you so much john for all of this this is really awesome and you took us right through right to the heart of the matter which is what i'm one of the words the heart of the matter for me vision for me it is so clearly important in my life right now and the way i see it uh, of the people around me, that we do not allow the economics, the uh, the political, and all of those the left brain stuff to be so heavy, which it is right now, that it squashes, it kills vision and matters of the heart. But for me, right now, this is what 
matters for me personally and that we need to do. Fight for that part. Not fight each other with Democrat and Republican kind of thing and not fight on the surface. Uh, Houston Smith um, was a religious historian and he studied religions all across the world. And he said that we can never understand another person's religion until we go deeply, more deeply into our own. And that's where I, I don't know where that vision is, you know, uh, because it's going to take uh, an awful lot of stuff from us to dig deeply into our own hearts and minds and talk about these things because we are so we were so um, inundated with everything. Technology itself, which is wonderful in one way, is very harmful in another because it's so fast and heavy, heavy and into my life, let's say encroachment. But we have to fight for it. We have to fight with matters of the heart. And perhaps seek a new vision. I don't know. Yeah, Patricia, I agree with you. Um, I think, you know, many of us here would say, uh, again, these issues are not partisan issues. Um, they are deeply ingrained in our culture, in our political system, our economic way of life. Uh, one of the reasons that I was drawn to uh, joining the Religious Society of Friends uh, and becoming a member at Fleshing Meeting was, I felt at that time that um, Quakers had these amazing testimonies and were witnesses uh, who actually manifested our beliefs into the world, who had a vision for equality and community and peace and all the things that I find very amazing about uh, Quaker history. But as I uh, became more familiar with the membership, especially in my own meeting, um, it really became clear that we have a lot more, we have a, we have a long road ahead as a faith community. Mm -hmm. um, I just had a conversation today um, with uh, an, another member of Fleshing Meeting because I feel that um, we have not, as a society, really come to terms with our own contributions to racism and white supremacy. You know, when people visit Fleshing Meeting, I give them tours and we talk about the history of abolitionists and uh, Quaker women joining the suffrage movement and um, supporting public education, all the great things that we care about. But Fleshing Meeting also had slaves. You know, uh, our endowment comes from the exchange of slaves. Um, mm -hmm. And um, our land is. Uh, our, our meeting house is built on stolen land uh, of the Matinecock, um Indians. Um, we haven't really dealt with these issues. And if you look at the history of Quakers, only a small minority were actually abolitionists. Uh, many Quakers resisted for decades the idea that uh, slaves were human and should not be traded uh, and treated like property and, sh and that we needed to release those slaves uh, from bondage. Um, and I, I think that it had, you know, our inability to recognize and acknowledge that history and to uh, move beyond symbolic gestures like land acknowledgements and you know uh we have a black lives matter banner on our meeting house and these are symbol symbolic gestures that i support but i think we have to go beyond the symbolism and try and as a meeting figure out how do we 
um, you know, ag acknowledge in a deep way th the fact that we're on stolen land. Uh, how do we uh, provide access to our meeting house and our property to uh, indigenous people who still live in our community? Um, how do we uh, acknowledge the fact that uh, part of our endowment is from this, the uh, trading of slaves? Um, you know, uh, I, I had a difficult time during the pandemic when I couldn't get uh, my own congregation to uh, share in our resources to feed people. Um, because I think people are so afraid that uh, they may lose everything um, if we do that. And to me, that's not the, the goal of a spiritual community um, I, I have friends now, um, Quaker friends, who are leaving because they couldn't get married. You know, no one was supporting their children and the spiritual uh, lives of, of families uh, at Flushing. Um, I, I, I had requested a travel letter and it was rejected by my own congregation um, because some people didn't agree with the phrase that I carried the love of the meeting with me. Um, and so I, I, I agree with you, you know, we have to really look within and I think spiritual, um, Spirituality is probably one of the keys to intervening in the current system of white supremacy and racism. Uh, I, I think we have to really move people deeply within themselves. Um, and I think the first step is acknowledging our, our own history and finding ways to acknowledge it in, a, in meaningful ways. Um, uh, I don't think, I feel like Quakers um, uh, maybe too much like regular <laughs> Americans in that way. You know, uh, we've kind of lost the ability um, as a separate faith to okay. uh, grapple deeply with these issues. Yeah. It's well said. And I think that this is where we are bit being called today, right now. And we have the opportunity. There is a crashing and breaking that has happened in everywhere, what through the pandemic, Trump, the whole thing. It's very huge, but there is space where hardly any of us know where the heck we're going, you know, any any time, <laughs> what to do, how to do it. We've got so many difficulties. But now is a good time is a wonderful time for us to be asking the, the questions you just talked about, because it is, it's hugely important. I believe in all my, I've been through lots of uh, ministerial things, you know, in the course of my life and I've been on the front lines with people. So I've seen too a lot of this and experienced it. But right now, this time calls for me to, for me, it calls for new vision, and I don't mean vision, a brand new painting. I'm talking about a new turnaround and asking ourselves, just as you said, to own what we are as human beings, mm -hmm. both good and bad inside each of us, and, um, and stand together to work it out in our meetings. I'm new to Quakerism and... I mean, I'm kind of not shocked, but I, I'm uh, a little surprised to hear that um, that other meetings aren't more like ours. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing this is pretty widespread in America that, I mean, one of the first things I learned about Quakerism, you can ask 100 Quakers what Quakerism is to them, and you're going to get 100 different answers. Um, and that's kind of the beauty of, why, you know, of, of why I want to be a part of this. 
Um, so that, that presents a challenge, you know, like for not so much a challenge, but there may not be all the same commonalities, but we have clearly many commonalities through us. Um, and I always thought one of those was, you know, advocating for the disenfranchised. Um, I thought that was something that went back to Fox and, and, you know, very long ago, but it seems like maybe in some parts and some meetings that this has changed. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, I have members in my meeting in Flushing who feel it's more important to hold on to our, our endowments than to uh, address community needs. Uh, anytime I bring up a, an idea or proposal to help the community, I'm immediately shut down by people who feel like we need to be fiscally responsible and I don't see the point of amassing wealth and not using it for our community. Um, I, I have members who uh, in, in worship try and justify the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the continued occupation of Korean people mm -hmm. by the US military. Um, and when I try and sit down with those members and explain how deeply hurt I am as an Asian American, um, as a Quaker, they don't get it. And um, it deeply troubles me that uh, I feel we've really, at least in my meeting, lost that way and um, have really um, strayed from the tradition of Quaker testimonies, which to me, it's, it's uh, incredibly powerful uh, if you explain to people who are not Quakers, as I was many years ago. I, I wonder if you can come back in a few months and tell us what's going on, um, and maybe <laughs> maybe we we have homework to do. Um, maybe Pat can lead us with that. Pat's <laughs> worship and ministry, and <laughs> she's yeah, she's a, a spiritual leader here. Uh, yeah, I would love to get your guidance. Um, you know, it's hard uh, in our meeting because our meeting is so small. You know, we barely have half a dozen people come to worship with us. Um, sometimes uh, I have to go outside of my meeting to uh, get any kind of clearness. Mm -hmm. It looks like we've pretty much covered the topic, but this evening, I, I think the idea of revisiting it in a few months is a good one. 